Hi, I'm Sari Sudhakaran. This is my review of the Airy Alexa LF that I've used on a recent project. It's more like a review from an operator's perspective. I wanted to tell you why I used or picked the Airy Alexa LF over an Alexa SXT or a Red Monstro. And some of the things that I've learned while shooting the LF might be useful to you in case you're planning on using the same camera for your shoots. The three cameras I had in mind for this shoot were one, the Alexa LF, the Red Monstro, and the Red Gemini. And obviously the Alexa SXT was the backup option in case nothing worked out. And the last option would be the Red Dragon, which I have used last year for another project. First of all, for the Red Gemini, very few people in India, and especially in Mumbai, carry the Red Gemini. Most of the people we tried to approach were middlemen who claimed the Gemini existed with somebody but we couldn't uh, get any hands-on tests with it. And the other thing is the, Ge the Red Gemini is a 5K camera with supposedly uh, equal in quality to the Aria Alexa. In which case, people who are already using the Aria Alexa, who are already renting it for their projects, and everything is uh, in place for the last 10 years of using the Alexa, why would they ship to a Gemini that offered roughly the same features but better low light ability? Low light ability is not a, uh, you know, a, a feature in the high-end filmmaking space where you are shooting commercials, television, and feature films. You have enough light to get great exposure and to create whatever it is you want. So low light isn't a major factor when it comes to those productions. So it's not a big selling point. Anyway, I was interested in the Gemini more than any other camera, and I was disappointed to see at least I couldn't find uh, a Gemini I could test, uh, let alone shoot with. And here's the thing, most manufacturers have released full frame sensor cameras in 2018. Aria Alexa LF, the Red Monstro, Sony Venice, uh, Canon has a C700. As far as I know, and I'm speaking to a lot of rental houses, uh, not only in India, but also a, a couple in the US, all of these full frame sensor cameras have flopped in the market. There's very little demand for these cameras. I think most of these manufacturers made a big miscalculation. They expected uh, cinematographers from the, D the DSLR revolution, those who shot on 5Ds and the Sony A7S and all that, they expected them to step up to these full frame sensors, but that hasn't happened. Most of the DPs who shot on film and on Super 35 are still around, and the number of people who actually care about the full frame look uh, is a very small percentage of the entire rental market. I'm talking about the high-end rentals, commercials, television, and feature films make up this market. And there are two other problems as well. The first one is the data rate. It scales up if you are going to a 4.5K sensor with the Aria Alexa LF as opposed to a 3.2K sensor. I mean, it's actually 2.8, but uh, you know they up it to 3.2. The data rate is much higher. Same applies to RED as well. RED has uh, at least done a better job in keeping their data rates under check, but there's still heavy workflows for people to adapt to. The other m bigger problem are the lenses. There are many lenses that cover full frame. Airy has released a Signature Prime, Zeiss has Super Supreme Primes, and so on. And I'll speak about lenses in just a bit, but very few people or very few DPs, you know, see a big difference between an Airy Master Prime and whatever is on offer. So why would they again scale up until the effects of the full frame sensor are very clearly evident in terms of image quality or in terms of the depth or feel or whatever? That doesn't exist. And if you have a really big budget, you can always scale up to the Airy Alexa 65. So you get that medium format look where the difference is more apparent in terms of uh, the space that you see in front of the lens and in terms of the image quality as well. But the full frame sensor is not that big of a jump from Super 35. Speaking about lenses, the Airy Signature Primes are obviously the, the, the best looking lenses on paper. Unfortunately, the rental house that I picked up the LF from lied to us and told us that the Signature Primes does not exist, which was untrue because people do have the Signature Primes in Mumbai, so we couldn't test it. I personally tested uh, three kinds of lenses. I tested the Zeiss Supreme Primes, the Sigma Cine Primes, and uh, the Cook S7 lenses. The Cook S7 was not bad, but it was too expensive for a few focal lenses that they had. And 
mm. which is why I couldn't pick them up for the for the shoot. Even though I did test it, I decided you know not to spend so, so much time on the S7 because I didn't have the focal lens that I wanted, and it was you know 2.5 times the price of uh, a Zeiss Supreme Prime. Now comparing the Zeiss Supreme Prime and the Sigma Prime, the Sigma Primes breathe like crazy. Uh, I mean, if you're on a 50 millimeter and you try to focus uh, through a long distance, it's almost like the difference between Super 35 and full frame. And that is a huge difference in terms of breathing. The image quality looks great from Sigma's. They're sharp, they look nice, and Sigma has certain advantages like the 14 millimeter uh, and so on. But overall, the Supreme Primes were the better bet. Now the Supreme Primes, I am not happy about. To me, looking at the image, there's nothing you know, majestic, and I'm talking comparing to the Master Primes. To me, the Supreme Primes seem like just glorified CP3 lenses. They also breathe, which in my mind is unacceptable at this level. So you have been producing high-end lenses, and now you are going back to you know, Ultra Prime territory. In fact, I would have preferred Ultra Primes over the Supreme Primes again uh, for this project. It has better control over many things like flare and whatever but it still breeds and the images just don't stand out in any sort of way. Nothing on the same level as the Airy Master Primes. I, I, I wish I could have uh, tested the Airy Signature Prime because that would have been my first choice definitely for this project. But the, the, uh, the lenses that I really wanted to use for this project were the Leica Thalia uh, lenses and nobody in Mumbai carries them so I couldn't even test it. So the lenses are a problem right now. There isn't a full set of lenses that cover uh, telephoto and the wide end except for Sigma, but Sigma doesn't have a very good reputation in the cine space. It's just entering the space. I couldn't even find Tokina lenses. I was excited to even look for Tokina, but I've never seen them in India anywhere. But operationally, the Zeiss Supreme Primes are really good because they all are 95 millimeter diameter lenses. Uh, you know, in all other respects, I think they're good lenses. It's just that I wasn't very impressed with the image quality from those lenses. So for the final test, we had the Alexa LF and the Red Monstro in-house. So I spent a couple of hours testing both cameras for different workflows. I wanted to see if I could handhold the Red Monstro camera. It's a great advantage because it was a carbon fiber body. It's very light. It's just a slightly uh, heavier than a full uh, DSLR with a battery grip, you know, like something like a Nikon D5 or something like the Leica S2 or S3 or whatever. So it's uh, not bad that way in, in a workflow sense the Monstro has a lot to offer. I made a video last year on how to pick between a RED and an Airy camera because RED has certain features that Airy does not give you and you would want to pick RED for those features whereas the Alexa has certain features that the RED doesn't have and you would want to pick the Alexa for those features. In this case the Monstro would have made sense uh, for certain things like for example if I was shooting 8K I could punch in and uh, have another mid shot from you know a long shot with the Monstro the data rates would have been uh, lower but I ended up not picking the Monstro and the reasons are first of all the viewfinder the viewfinder for the uh, I don't know wh whether they were using an older viewfinder or the newer bomb uh, viewfinder or whatever but I, they told me it's a newer one it just looked like you're looking through a tunnel t on, on a small image it just didn't look good at all especially because I had the LF on the side and the Arri Alexa LF has a newer EVF2 a version 2 viewfinder which just looks amazing never seen anything like that so and I knew I was going to be operating on the LF with the uh, viewfinder at my eye most of the time in sunlight and there was no way I could compromise on the image quality of the viewfinder that was one major plus on the Alexa side the second major plus was with the LF you have wireless inbuilt in the body itself and we were uh, transmitting to a Teradek receiver which connected to a Shogun which we use for playback and a Sony OLED monitor that we use to check framing or for makeup issues or whatever. And the next thing was we could shoot ProRes with the Alexa LF. I decided at the beginning of the project to shoot ProRes 444 so that was a major plus that the Monstro didn't have. Uh, but my system can easily handle Monstro 8K footage as well, so I, have, I, had, I didn't have any problems with that. And later on, after the first hour or so of shooting, I decided to switch to Airy RAW anyway, because it just seemed make, uh, made more sense to me. And lastly, 
there were only there are very few monstro bodies available in in Mumbai uh, and the problem is if something happened to the body I would not be able to replace it with another body that had similar characteristics to a monstro on the other hand if the LF failed which is r rare but can happen if the LF failed I can still go back to a normal Alexa XT or SXT with the exact same sensor the exact same color science I'm not talking about the sensor size the size is smaller but I get the exact same color science there's no problem matching I don't have to change anything in the workflow all I have to do is get the second body in and continue shooting but with red if I don't get another monstro then I might have to pick a dragon because the Gemini doesn't exist and there's a hell of a difference between the image quality of a dragon and a monstro the monstro is much cleaner and more pleasing looking than the dragon the dragon has more noise in the shadows so it would have been a tough decision for me so overall these are the reasons I picked the LF for this specific project and the size advantage of the monster didn't make sense here because I was going to be on a jib 99% of the time the size advantage of the monster just vanishes so operationally how is uh, the Alexa LF I mean there's nothing to say it just works like a in any other Alexa the menus are the iPhone of the camera world they're so easy so intuitive and right there anybody can learn them anybody can change anything easily with just a touch of a couple of buttons and that's why the Alexas are so popular because you have another camera assistant stepping in if somebody's not there they can pick it up easily and they can just continue shooting but with red even the people who come with the red cameras and who know so much about red cameras there's just so much to learn and so much uh, technical information that you have to understand even to just apply them on the red camera so it's much more difficult for somebody to step in quickly and pick up a red camera and shoot but on an Alexa that's not a problem at all you can train a monkey to operate an Alexa menu in about five minutes it's not that hard the side of the Alexa body gets hot but not hot enough that you would you know not want to shoot but in a country like India obviously if you're going to be hand holding the Alexa LF it is not very comfortable so you have to be you know hydrated most of the time the LF is extremely heavy so we did try a shoulder mount just to see how it would work out for my shoot but I decided against it focusing is a little harder because of the larger sensor and if you're going to T1.5 or T1.8 it's going to be a lot harder for your focus puller to pull focus we had a C motion uh, rigged to the Zeiss Supreme Prime so my focus puller was pulling wirelessly and it worked perfectly uh, and most of the shots you know I've been checking it after are perfectly in focus but we were shooting at T8 T11 most of the time on average sometimes T5.6 but never above 5.6 except for the night shots we uh, use it wide open but otherwise we were shooting at T8 most of the time we use a TV logic monitor just for framing for the focus puller and the grip who was operating the uh, dolly the TV logic monitors are probably the worst monitors that people use professionally I don't know why anybody uses TV logic you cannot see any anything uh, even if it's turned slightly away from you it's just so, so much clear the waveform is a tiny coin size that you cannot read the uh, now false color tool cannot be adjusted so you might as well use the false color tool in the area Alexa itself you have access to the false color as well as punch in zoom in the viewfinder right at your fingertips unfortunately in the Alexa LF the false color cannot be adjusted I wish it could be adjusted but right now it's not adjusted so you have to just live with whatever you know Aries giving you I did request for a small HD monitor instead of the TV logic but you know somebody dropped the ball on that one the wireless system worked perfectly uh, it's a we use a Teradek system and there's very low latency on the Atom Shogun we use it to play back the footage and to also initially I wanted to try to record proxies on the Shogun but then I decided against it because I can always create proxies at home there is just no point in you know taking separate files and getting confused we only had a data wrangler on set we didn't have a proper DIT so all he had to do was copy the footage to my hard drive by the way if you're shooting uh, the Alexa LF you need a lot of hard drive uh, per day the way we were shooting because you're shooting for 14 hours I managed to fill about three and a half terabytes of data in one day and I was calculating for four terabytes so we really hit that limit and most of the time because we shot area raw and most of the time because we shot at a higher frame rate 
I was shooting mostly at 90 FPS and sometimes at 60 FPS, very rarely at 25 FPS. Which is one of the reasons why I picked the LF is because of those high frame rates and I decided to switch to Airy Raw again because Airy Raw has higher frame rates like 90 FPS in open gate mode as opposed to only 60 FPS in ProRes. I wish Airy would allow uh, you know, ProRes also to have a higher frame rate. I don't know what the problem is. It's such a big camera. You have the circuitry inside. You have the processors that can handle it. Well, I don't know what the problem is. So I wish, uh, you know, that was a, uh, a possible. Then fewer people would need to shoot Airy Raw at higher frame rates. And the data, is, uh, the data rate is just mind-boggling. But if you're doing the regular amount of setups that you do on a feature film, you might hit about one terabyte a day on average if you are shooting at 24, 25 FPS. So imagine a 30-day shoot, you're looking at 20 to 30 terabytes of data. And depending on your shooting ratio, of course, but the way people shoot nowadays in digital, you're, you're looking at a lot of data if you're shooting open gate area raw. And we shot open gate because I wanted the ability to you know, pan and scan a little bit in the frame. The other modes of the, uh, the Alexa LF is you can also have a ultra high definition mode, which is 4K, smaller sensor size for a lower data rate, but if you have to go that way, then you might as well shoot with the normal Alexa SXT or XT, which is why another reason why the LF isn't popular, because if you want to shoot anamorphic, and anamorphic is something I wanted to try for this project, and I decided against it because obviously if, if I'm shooting with the LF, there's no point shooting anamorphic. There aren't any good high-end anamorphic lenses for the full-frame format. And if I wanted to shoot anamorphic for, uh, you know, just using uh, the Arri Master Anamorphics, then I could have just picked the Alexa XT instead. The last major difference between the, L the LF and the other Alexas is the battery. The, I think the new LF has about 28 or 24 volts, I'm not sure, but it's a different battery as opposed to the old Alexas. It consumes more power. But again, if you're taking it from a rental house and they have these big lithium batteries that they bring on, you can just go on and on. You don't have to worry about things when you're renting it. It's only when you're an owner operator that these problems crop up. As far as the image quality is concerned, you know, there's nothing to say. It's the exact same sensor, just scaled up. The image quality is amazing. It is world class. The colors, right, just with the uh, the uh, Rec 709 lookup table, I bring it to DaVinci Resolve and I just put on the lookup table and it already looks amazing. The colors, the skin tone, everything pops in a way that is so pleasing to the eye. It's no surprise with the LF, it's got all the advantages of a regular Alexa, maybe even better, slightly better in low light. We didn't test the low light abilities, but the night shots that I shot, everything we shot was at ISO 800, by the way, which is the native ISO. And if you can look at the footage, it's just perfect. I mean, you know, there's nothing to complain about as far as image quality is concerned. And that was my main motivation when picking the, uh, the Alexa LF. And finally, uh, just because I had a Nikon Z6 on set, I asked my assistant Shrey to, you know, shoot a little bit of B-roll or the behind the scenes with the Nikon Z6, and he did a good job, but it allows me the opportunity to, you know, give you a comparison between the Nikon Z6 and the Alexa LF. Frankly, there's no comparison, okay? Uh, the Nikon was shooting 8-bit 420 internally, the, LX, uh, the LF was shooting Airy Raw, but I've shot with Log as well. By the way, my N-Log video is out, so if you'd like to see how to expose N-Log correctly, please click the link in the description and subscribe to my email list and that video will be delivered to your inbox. Coming back to the subject, even with N-Log, you can clearly see the difference in skin tones and quality uh, between the Alexa and a Nikon Z6. It is just night and day. I did a, uh, a video a few months ago between the Blackmagic, the GH5, and the Alexa XT. If you want, you can watch that earlier video. I'll link to it below. Uh, you can see all the tests that I've done. So there's no point, you know, repeating these tests. And it's just a, a waste of time. Now, I don't want to create, you know, a false impression in your mind that somehow these small mirrorless cameras in the two to $10,000 range can compare to the Alexa LF. They cannot. Image quality-wise, the moment you put on an Alexa footage onto a production monitor and you see it for the first time, you will see the difference. It just it isn't necessary to convince anybody because the image speaks for itself. When you're shooting any project, especially feature films or fictional work, you are putting your camera through a lot of different lighting situations, a lot of different environments, and a camera has to perform in all of those environments and all of those specifications. When you put different kind of skin tones, it should all look good. 
when you show it different colors, like you know, a gorgeous morning landscape, it should all look good. Because that is the, the very definition of a cinema camera. And there is no camera under $10,000, I would say, that can give you great colors, great skin tones across different lighting situations. It just doesn't exist. The, the Alexa, the Monstro, these cameras have earned their reputation by proving that they can deliver consistent and high quality color. And of course, a lot of dynamic range. The Nikon Z6 only has 12 stops. Anything in the two to $3,000 budget has about 12 to 13 stops of dynamic range. On the other hand, the Alexa LF has 14 stops across the entire ISO range. And if you're shooting at its native ISO, which is ISO 800, I suspect it can go up to ISO, I'm uh, sorry, 16 stops of dynamic range because it uses a dual gain architecture. I don't want to get into technical details, but it's basically how an HDR function works on your iPhone. That's what they do in the camera, which is one of the reasons why the camera is so big. They also have excellent cooling for the sensor. And because of that, the sensor is able to, you know, pump out a tremendous amount of gorgeous information that other cameras cannot match, even high-end cameras, because you still have to cool the sensor. Sensor cooling is a very important thing. The hotter a sensor gets, the more noise it generates in the image. So keeping it cool is a very fundamental problem. And, but of course, to keep it cool, you need larger camera bodies. It's all, you know, a chicken and egg problem that you have to keep finding a sweet spot kind of compromise for the market. Alexa has decided, uh, Aerie has decided with their Alexa cameras to not compromise on image quality because they know that people who are going to use their cameras have large systems like dollies and cranes to operate with. They really don't need to make the, uh, the uh, camera smaller. But for an owner operator, it's a different situation. When you come to mirrorless cameras, they do well under certain, uh, certain cir circumstances. But if you test them across different situations, that's when you find out their flaws. It's sp uh, similar to, the, uh, to an iPhone or any mobile phone. There, there might be certain pictures that you take which look as good as any DSLR or anything, but that does not apply to all pictures under all situations. So please don't fall under the, uh, you know, the trap of listening to people who want to compare, you know, hundred dollar camera to a million dollar camera and say, you know, look how close they are. However, the colors on the Z6 are amazing. As I said in my Nikon Z6 review, which I published last week, the, the skin tones look amazing for what you get in that small package, but you're looking on the internet on a regular monitor. Most people who are watching these videos don't have a proper broadcast monitor. You're seeing it on a monitor that's not calibrated. You're seeing it in YouTube under different streaming conditions after so much of heavy compression. You're, de you're seeing it on different screen sizes and resolutions. And I'm not even showing you the 4K version with this video. If your project is going directly to the internet and you know 99% of projects are going directly to the internet, then you can use lower end cameras for most of your work. But if you have higher ambitions, especially if you want your film to be seen on a large screen, or if you're thinking of sending it to a film festival where they'll project your movie on a, on a large multiplex size screen, then you need a better camera because the image quality can fall apart very quickly. Now, whether or not that is important to your work is a different matter because a high quality DP or high quality cinematographer can make great images even with low-end cameras. This is the reality. But a poor cinematographer or DP, even if you give them an Alexa LF, doesn't mean that they're, they're going to make something you know, on the same level as a Roger Deakins or an Emmanuel Lubezki, which is also a question I ask myself. If I wanted to be perfectly honest, I'm not at the level where I can justify to myself that what I have in front of the camera is good enough for an Alexa LF or a Red Monstro. Do I have Leonardo DiCaprio in front of my camera? Do I have a huge burning set in front of my camera? Is my project going to, you know, 3000 screens uh, this summer or whatever? No. So in a way it's hard for me also to justify using a high-end camera. The only reason I picked the LF is because it's cheap to rent in India. And the reason it's cheap to rent in India is because it's a flop. If, if, if it were going out like hot cakes, the rental prices would at least be twice a regular Alexa SD, or at least 50% more, but it's not. It's roughly the same price. All the cameras are roughly the same price in Mumbai. I don't know how, how it is in the rest of the world, but right here, if you can afford an Alexa LF, then why not? Uh, production people are cheap. They try to pinch every penny possible. If a DP 
is using an Alexa. They have to justify why they're using the Alexa. Right now, since I've been reviewing the Nikon Z6, I have been very happy with the results, as I told you in my uh, review. If you want to know what my settings are, I have them available to download, so you can you know, just load them into your camera and have your camera ready for cinematography. I've also given seven custom cine profiles that you can load to your camera as well. In addition to that, if you would like to learn how to expose analog and how to grade analog and how I've set up my favorite picture control, it's all available for free if you subscribe to my email list. Bottom line is there is no camera that is good in an absolute sense or bad in an absolute sense. Every camera has features and every camera can be used within its capabilities to achieve whatever objective it is. It's only when you try to achieve objectives that the camera is not designed to do is when you've come up with uh, problems. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask me in the comments below. I'll see you in the next video. Bye now.